You know, every holiday we have is a two-day holiday. Shoshana is two days. Sukkot, the first two days of Sukkot are two days. Last two days of Sukkot, Samchas Torah, is two days. Shavuos is two days. Purim is the only holiday that's one day. How come Purim is one day? It would seem like if any day would be, any holiday we want to have at least more than one day of it would be Purim. It's such a fun holiday, such a, such a simcha. How come it's not a one day? I asked his bartender this question earlier this week, and he said, um, he said in Israel it's a week. <laughs> so uh, it's not officially a week. Uh, it's officially one day. The question is why? Why is it only one day? First of all, to understand this question, we have to, we have to understand a little bit more about why all other holidays have two days. So the way it worked was, was the Jewish court would establish uh, whether the 30th day of the previous month was day one of the next month, or was it the 30th day of the month before. So let's say Shvat. Does Shvat have 29 days, or does it have 30 days? And every month there was a question how many days it should have. So the way it worked was is witnesses would come to the court, and they would say, we saw the new moon, and therefore today is really the first day of the next month. But that's what the Jewish court would say in Jerusalem. Let's say you didn't live in Jerusalem. Let's say you lived a week journey away from Jerusalem. There's no WhatsApp, there's no Facebook. So how would you find out? So the Obezdin, the court, would send out messengers, and they would travel, and they would announce wherever they went, to every Jewish village, every Jewish city, hey, Rosh Chodesh was on this and this day, Last month, the first day of the month was on a Monday, and therefore Pesach is going to be on this and this day. And if you found that out before Pesach started, then you knew what day Pesach started. If you didn't, what would you do? You keep two days. So that's why they, that's why every holiday is two days. Even though now our calendar isn't established by witnesses coming to the Jewish court, our calendar is established by uh, a, a strict calendar, but... We still keep the custom that our forefathers did. We have to keep the custom of our forefathers. And one of the reasons given is because if there will ever be a decree to forbid the study of Torah, uh, we should be able to at least keep the holiday correctly because we're keeping the custom of our forefathers and we have two days of the Yantiv and one of them is going to be right. So that's the reason why every holiday has two days. But it doesn't explain why Purim has one day. So... One explanation given is that the holiday of Purim is a rabbinic holiday. So the sages saw fit to enact a decree to have a two-day holiday for all the biblical holidays. And it's just to make sure we keep the holidays, so they add another day. But a rabbinical holiday, they didn't see that as a reason to, such an important thing to do, and therefore they didn't uh, uh, make that rule. But the question, though, is, is why wouldn't they? Why would they only make this rule for biblical holidays, not rabbinical holidays? There are some commentaries. This is a question that is that 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 is a lot of a lot of um, various answers to our history have been given to this uh, question. One answer that's given is in the Megillah itself. It says Chok v'lo Yavor, which means this is the day it has to be. It cannot be another day, since it says it has to be this day, not a different day. So therefore, we're not allowed to make an extra day, because making an extra day would transgress the law of the Megillah, Chok Valiyavar. Yeah, but the Rabbanon said, Chok Valiyavar. So, there are, the, the problem with that answer is that there's also a biblical injunction, the Torah says, don't add to the mitzvahs, don't add to the commandments. So if the problem was, you're not allowed to, go, you're not allowed to add a day, you shouldn't be, able to, you shouldn't be allowed to add a day of Sukkot either, you shouldn't be allowed to add a day of Passover either. The reason why we are allowed to is because we're not really adding a day. We're not really going against the Torah and we're adding a day to the holiday. We're not adding a day. We're just saying that we should keep this another day just in case the uh, court established Rosh Chodesh a different day or just because of the custom of forefathers. We're not saying that this is a biblical obligation to have a second day of Yantiv. We're just doing this because this is a, a, the sages told us to do because of various reasons. So if that's true for every other holiday, so it shouldn't be considered going against the Torah by making another second day of Purim, like it's not considered going against the Torah by making a second day of Sukkot. Was it because they, everyone knew when Purim was because they were like born beforehand that they were going to be killed on that day? Because they were like certain of the day high? There is a similar thing. It's a little hard. I wasn't going to go into this one. It's a little complicated, but I'll, I'll try to say it once. 
Um, basically, some people answer like this. They say, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> it's so complicated. <laughs> Anyways, so 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 question is, how come Purim is one day? Every other holiday is two days. This one's one day. What's the reason? So there is actually one holiday that's one day. One holiday is one day. Yeah, Yom Kippur. Very right? yeah, good. Yom Kippur is one day. Why is Yom Kippur one day? Why is Yom Kippur two days? Yeah, <laughs> Imagine the base tile auction the second day of, of Yom Kippur. <laughs> who's who's going to show up to that auction, right? But uh, th- that's the reason. The reason because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to make two days in a row of fasting. It's a dangerous thing. And therefore... Oh, what? Right. That was a one-time thing. But I'm establishing that all the Jewish people should do this every year. Two days of fasting is, is dangerous. That's, that's the reason that's given. Um, but there's a deeper reason. Deeper reason like this. The second day of every holiday, what's it called? The second day of every holiday. The second day of every holiday is called the second day of exile, of a holiday of exile. That's what it's called, the second day of the Yontif of exile. So there is the official holiday, and there's a holiday which was instituted for, for a time of exile. On Yom Kippur, we are above the exile. On Yom Kippur, we don't eat, we don't drink, we abstain from all physical things. So when you're Kippur, we're like angels, since we're so angelic, since we're so holy, so we don't, we don't need to have a second day for exile because we're above the exile. That's why your Kippur is one day. What about Purim? So the truth is, what's higher in Kippur or Purim? It says in the Zohar, Yom Kippur means a day which is like Purim. And the virtue of Yom Kippur is, what's so good about Yom Kippur is it's almost as good as Purim. But it's not Purim. Purim is even better than Yom Kippur. Why is Purim better than Yom Kippur? What's so good about Purim? It even surpasses Yom Kippur. So the answer is like this. We know that the purpose of creation is to make a home for Hashem in the lowest realm. So to be in Yom Kippur state, state in Yom, to be Yom Kippuric in that state on Yom Kippur is not, is not so difficult considering that you're not eating, you're not drinking, and you're all day in Shul. So to be, hey Ruvin, Shalom Aleichem. To be, to be, uh, if you're looking for your gartel, it's over here. Alaikum shalom. Shalom. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, so to be, to be in a Yom Kippur state on Yom Kippur is not such a challenge because you're a little bit like an angel. And already, when you're not eating, you're not drinking. But Purim, it's the opposite. Purim, you're eating and you're drinking, and not just you're eating and drinking. You're supposed to eat and drink more than a regular hunt. If in fact, the, the greatest simcha period, the greatest joy period, is is, is on Purim. Um, just to qualify that statement for a second, uh, people, Purim gets a bad uh, rap. People say bad things about Purim. I want to, I want to, I want to dispel all lashon hara that's said about Purim right now. People say that the Talmud says you're supposed to drink on Purim until you cannot tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman. And that sounds like a very foolish thing to do. Why get so drunk? What's the point of that? So Hasidus actually says. You're never supposed to think that Mordechai is Haman. Never. Never. Never think Mordechai is Haman. That's, that's ridiculous. You think that Mordechai is Haman? No. That's not, that's not what it means. Your logic says that Mordechai and Torah and Mitzvahs and the Jewish people, they should be blessed. And Haman and all things associated with the negativity should be shunned. What tells you that? Your mind tells you that. Your heart tells you that. But does your soul tell you that? Yes. You don't always access your neshama. You don't always access that part of you which is super rational. On Purim, not only does your mind say blessed is Mordechai, not only does your heart say blessed is Mordechai, but you're able, by saying a little Lachaim and celebrating Purim, you're able to access a part of your neshama that says blessed is Mordechai. Your, your, your devotion to Torah Mitzvahs could be something which is super rational, higher than, higher than logic. That's, that's what Purim is about. The question is, is though, it doesn't seem, it seems a bit, a little, a bit incongruous to a day that's supposed to be like Yom Kippur, or even better than Yom Kippur, they're eating and drinking, it would seem like we should do a little bit of Yom Kippur things on Purim. We should not eat and not drink, and then we'll be able to reach the level of Yom Kippur. But we eat and drink. How, how's that, what, what does eating and drinking Yom Kippur on Purim uh, have to do with, how does that help? Uh, okay, it, it must, we see how Purim is better than Yom Kippur, because the whole point of a creation is Hashem wants a home in the lowest realm. Fine. So that explains why in Purim you have to eat and you have to drink, and that, that, that's a higher level. But why is that even possible? Why is it even possible that in Purim you're able to reach such, such a high level? How, how does that happen? So when I send this question, let's ask another question. Megillah, in English is a term, it's actually an English term, a long Megillah. It's, it's called, 
something's really long, it's called it's called a long Megill. It's not, not it's, it's it's in the Websters. It's not it's not only a Jewish. Yeah, it's called a Megillah, right? Gansa Megillah, right? So right, it's not even called a long Megillah. It's called a whole Megillah, or not even whole. Fine. So, speaking of whole, speaking of whole Megillah. There's actually an argument in the Talmud about what part of the Megillah has to be read. One opinion is you have to read the whole Megillah. That's the halacha, that's what we follow. There's a second opinion which says you have to read only the part of the Megillah after Mordechai is introduced. And a third opinion which says you have to read the part of the Megillah after Haman is introduced. But why would you not have to read the whole thing if they wrote it so we would remember the entire thing, we would know everything that happened, and we wouldn't forget? I'll ask you a better question. Why should we even read the first two chapters of the Megillah? It's, it's, so, it's so, like, he made a big party. So what? He made a huge party. Woo! For 180 days. It seems like such a ridiculous thing. And not only that, there's some parts of the Megillah which seem to be very, like, um, chauvinistic and, like, ridiculous. Example. In the first chapters, we, what do we have over there? We have... Achashverosh does away with Vashti. And, and why do away with Vashti? Why? He called all his advisors to him. What should we do? The queen refuses to come. What do his advisors say? Do you know what's going to happen if you allow Vashti to do this? By the way, do you see that, that the video going around with, with, with making the whole story of Purim in text? You saw that? No. Oh, it's very, very funny. You have to watch the entire... They, 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 they did the whole story of Megillah in text. Like Achashverosh is texting Vashti oh. and Haman and... And they all have iPhones, whatever. Anyway, so so um, it's very funny. Anyway, so 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 Achashverosh says to Haman, "What should we do? Should want to come?" He asks all his advisors, all of his advisors, what to do. What do his advisors say? They say, "Listen, if you're not going to let this happen, then every man is not going to be is not going to be in charge of his household. This is going to mess up every household. You got to show who's boss." And therefore, he kills Vashti. It sounds like a, a story from Chelm. It sounds like a story from like. Ridiculous story. And yet we read this and mitzvah to read this. Why, why, why do you have to read this? What's, why is it so important? So we should know how dangerous it was for Esther to be queen. Some, uh, some commentaries say that the fact that uh, Mordechai actually uh, couldn't have told the guards of Achashverosh when they came looking for Esther that he doesn't know where she is, couldn't say that. Why couldn't he say that? Because... Achashverosh should establish that every man is supposed to be in charge of his household. And therefore he couldn't say an excuse, oh, I don't know where she is, because it's, a, it's an established law. So that, that's what some commentaries say. Some commentaries say that um, the reason, let's think about it, the Jewish people were supposed to be killed a year later. Now if you knew, if you're a Goy and you're an anti-Semitic, and you knew the, Goy, the Jewish people are all going to be killed a year later, so why wait a year? You know, why don't you go pillage and plunder right away? The answer is, Sam Sofer says, is that they saw how the king is such a wishy-washy king and he's so making such rash decisions about his queen, they knew that it's possible that he'll change his mind. That's another reason why that, that chapter is, is, is put in according to many, many opinions. But the real, the real idea that we get from the Gila, uh, we can stand a little bit better thinking about schmaltz. You know what schmaltz is? No, never heard schmaltz. Chicken fat. Oh, yeah. I it was any fat. Well, yeah, actually, this story is actually about, I think it's duck fat in this story I wanted to share with you. There was a couple named Zusha and Achomar Golan. They were living in, in a town in Russia called Babroisk when the Second World started. And Rabbi Margolin, Rabbi Zusha Margolin, he was drafted into the Russian army. And his wife, Nechama, was left alone with her three children, two boy, two girls. Uh, one of them later grew up to be Mina Rifkin, if you know who she is, or another one grew up to be Tova Altois. Anyway, so the matriarchs of big, big Chabad families, Rifkin and Altois, and so they, they their father was in, in taken away, and they want to get to Tashkent, which is a little safer, and they're walking together, and there was, there was a hunger, it was, it was impossible to live to stay where they were, and on, on the road, their mother died. Not only their mother died, their brother died. They had to bury their brother with their own hands. And people saw them walking, and the people were kind. They see these orphans walking in the street, and they decided they have to put them into an orphanage. And they put them into an orphanage, and that's where they were. But years passed, and uh, eventually the people running the orphanage after the war are thinking, what should we do with these, these two girls that come from a Jewish family? Hey, do you know any of your relatives? 
you know, is there anyone alive that knows you guys? Do you want to go back to your, any of your family? So how would they know any relatives? They don't, they don't know any relatives. You know the address of any of your relatives. So was, how do they know their address? They didn't know any address. But then Minna remembered something. What happened? Her mother, every year before Pesach, would send a package of duck schmaltz, duck uh, fat, to her relative, her, 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 uh, her sister-in-law, Yaakov Yosef Raskin. Yaakov Yosef Raskin, you know, people don't like using processed foods on, on Pesach, and I'm not sure what was available in Russia at that time anyways, if they even had kosher for Passover oil, probably not. So they used to use chicken fat or duck fat instead of oil. So, so how do you send uh, duck fat in the mail? You probably know, because you've probably experienced it. Saying, oh, you have it. Okay, fine. So what they did was, you take the duck fat, put it into diapers, and put the diapers into a box, and then you send the duck fat in the box to whoever wants the duck fat. Well, no, they didn't have disposable diapers. Right. It wasn't huggies or any pampers or anything. So I didn't try this. I don't know how exactly how it worked, but that's the basic idea. What happened was, is Nechama Margolin went with her daughter Mina, and they went to the post office, and they said they want to send this package. So the postmaster looks at the package, and he says, I'm not sending this. So why not? It's leaking. It's not leaking. It is leaking. It's not leaking. It is leaking. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So Mrs. Margolin went back home to go get some more diapers and more boxes to repackage the, the, uh, the duck schmaltz, the, the, the chicken fat, the duck fat. And while she's away, her daughter, Minna, is alone with the package, alone with, alone with the duck fat. And what does she have to do? Just, she has nothing to do. There's no... You know, the Russian post office doesn't have any Reader's Digest or anything like that. She just has nothing else to read. It. So for, the, for the several hours that her mother, she's looking at the package, and she's an address in the package, and she's reading that address and package over and over and over and over again, so that many years later, and she's an orphan, do you know any addresses? Actually, I do know an address. And she knew the address of the Raskins, and, that, and that's why there is an Altoy's family, and there's a Rifkin family, it's all because of because of the, of, because of the, of, of the uh, chicken fat, the duck fat. That's, that's where it comes from. So similarly, Achashverosh becomes the king in the third year. I'm sorry, in the third year of his kingdom, of his reign, he makes his big party. And then in the seventh year, he kills, he kills Vashti, and then Aster is called, and then in the 13th, and then many years later, in the 12th year of, of his reign, Haman makes his decree. It was all orchestrated from years before so that the Jewish people should be saved. So you see from the fact that we're reading the entire Megillah, you see something. You see that even that, that there's parts of our life that we don't, we don't know. And the reason we don't know what the reason for these parts of our life are is because we didn't see the whole story. So we were told to read the entire Megillah because by looking at the entire Megillah, then you see how all these different parts that didn't make sense, they come together. Life is a puzzle. And each, in, each, in each piece has, a, has an importance to it. So their opinion is because as the Torah, Esther wrote Kol Tokef, all the strength. The strength, of, the strength of Mordechai, the strength of Haman, what does the Megillah mean? But the halacha is, that we, we, we do, is we have to read all the parts that seem to be so, doesn't seem to be so intelligent, but no, it, it doesn't, it, when you're going through it, it doesn't seem intelligent. But looking back at the whole story, you see how each piece was part of the puzzle. Right, so why would they say not to read the whole thing? So we're discussing the halacha now. We'll have another class that's trying to figure out their opinion. Well, <laughs> Okay, getting back to our other question. What was our first question? Why is Purim one day? Right, why is Purim one day? Okay, so... so <laughs> Purim is one day. Why is it one day? So, think about this. The Jewish people had this decree hanging over their heads. They had this decree hanging over their heads that they're going to be killed. At any moment, if any of them wanted to escape this decree, what could they have done? Convert. They could have converted. Right, they could have saved themselves. They could have converted. So why didn't they? Because the Alt Rebbe said the Jew does not want and Jew cannot separate himself from Hashem. If they would have converted, they would, Haman would have accepted them. It wasn't like in Germany. Haman would accept, summons, this is a decree against the Jews. Anyone wants to opt out, they could, they'll be accepted. What religion were they? I don't know. I don't know. I know what religion there was. But, but um, the reason why they... So think about this. They're, they have this decree over their heads and they're living their lives, and they're going to work, and they're eating, and they're drinking, and then they're conducting their family life, etc. And yet, the whole time, what are they thinking about? I'd rather die as a Jew than, than live a different religion. 
So, the, so they're living a daily lifestyle, all kinds of things happening, and they're, they're, but the frequency that they're living on is Mesir Nefesh. They may be eating, maybe drinking, maybe going to school, maybe picking up their kids, dropping off their kids, and all kinds of things that we do, all kinds of normal things. But the whole time, what are they? What, what's 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 on their minds? Mesir Nefesh, devotion to Hashem, and that's why they merited to create a holiday through their sacrifice. That how does a holiday work? It's a regular day. You eat and you drink and you do all the things you do on a regular day. And yet, what zone do you reach on Purim? You reach the zone of Yom Kippur. You reach a, you're able to reach even higher than Yom Kippur. You're able to achieve all kinds of things, as, a, as it says in the, the, the Torah, that on the day of Purim, anyone puts their hand out, you have, to, you, have to, you have to respond. So the same is also with each of us. We put our hand out to Hashem, Hashem has to respond. So just like on Yom Kippur, there's, there's, there's conditions. You have to do teshuva, you have to be sincere. Purim doesn't have conditions. Purim is higher. You're eating, and you're drinking, and you're able to achieve on a Purim what you can't achieve. Any- Why is that? Because that's what they did. They were on a Yom Kippur frequency on a regular day. And that's what the story of, of the Megillah is telling us, that it's, it's not just that there's, that there's parts of our life that we don't understand and we'll understand one day and we'll, look, we'll middle, middle the story. What was, what, was, what was the color throughout the whole story? The color of the story was Mesir's Nefesh. There's a, teaching, there's a story about Shemta, which I think I shared with you once upon a time, uh, which I think explains this um, we, we, we can, uh, in a way that we can relate to perhaps. There was a Jew came to Baal Shemta once, he told Baal Shemta, I want to learn how to eat, teach me how to eat. So Baal Shemta said to him, you want to learn how to eat, you have to go travel to Yankel. Yankel will teach you how to eat. He travels to Yankel, and Yankel has his huge breakfast. He has, you know, he has, he has, he has, he has huge French rolls and uh, eggs and uh, cheese, and it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. A second course, a third course, it's just breakfast. And the guy can't keep up. He's like, I can't. Baal Shemta told me to come to you to learn how to, how to uh, eat. So I know, I know what Baal Shemta wanted. So the guy told him, he said, when I was when I was a child, I once saw a Jew get beaten up by non-Jews and killed. I decided that I am never going to be a scrawny little Jew. And he eat, he ate, and he ate. So, so he's eating. But what is he thinking about when he's eating? While he's eating, he's thinking about Monsieur Snafesh. He's thinking about something higher. So that's what Purim gives us. It's a regular day. It's not, a, it's, it's not forbidden to work on a Purim. You're allowed to work. And yet the whole theme of Purim is you're on a level of Yom Kippur. And, and not just Purim. Purim is supposed to give a blessing to the rest of the year as well. The Friedrich Rebbe said that his father said, a Jew was not put in exile. Only a body of a Jew was in exile. And Hashem is higher than exile. So the whole year... We're supposed to be in that zone of of Purim, the zone of uh, our, our, that we're not we're not we're not inhibited at all to be who we are and to express our neshama, and that's why Purim is one day. Just like Yom Kippur is one day, because on Yom Kippur we're it we're like, it's a time of Mashiach, we're above the exile. On Purim we're also above the exile, except on Purim it's even more wonderful because we're living regular days, eating and drinking, and yet we're still above the exile. And Purim imbues the rest of the year also to that, that same kind of frequency, that same kind of energy, that you're living a regular life and, and yet you're totally above it. You're, you're, you're in the world and yet you're living with Mashiach, living with Amuna, and, and you're, 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 you're feeling your neshama and whatever, whatever you're doing. And that's what I wanted to share. Any tomatoes, cucumbers, criticism, questions, zucchini. I'm glad you recorded it.